प्रेजेंटेड बाय ईबिक्स कैश हर खुशी के लिए काफी है Hello and welcome you're with us here on business today I'm Abha Bakaya here are the headlines tonight Sensex snaps two day losing run jumps over 850 points as market rebounds Nifty back above 17150 Auto Financials metals shine Business Today TV exclusive government planning 8425 crore rupee viability gap funding scheme for fertilizer plants scheme to produce urea from green hydrogen Another big Business Today TV exclusive former RBI governor Raghuram Rajan discusses the biggest challenges for the Indian economy and farm laws in an exclusive conversation Anger and frustration as Indian origin CEO in US fires 900 employees over a brutal Zoom call weeks after his company raised 750 million dollars in funding. The bulls back in action in trade today. The banking shares witness buying interest ahead of the monetary policy meeting outcome. Metal auto shares also are locked up decent gains. The Nifty Bank Index closed the days up 2.47% or 882 points the nifty 50 index settling with gains of 265 points at 17177 while sensex snapped its two day losing run jumping over 850 points as market rebounded the broader markets also finished higher following the benchmarks top gainers today hindalco up over 5% tata steel up 4% axis bank up 3.6% icici bank up 3.5% and tata motors up 3.2% some of the laggards are britannia sipla divis labs asian paints IOC The S&P BSE mid cap and small cap index closed up 1.3% and 1.1% respectively Shares of Indigo soared in trade today the stock was up 5% after Interglobe Aviation scheduled an EGM on December 30th the EGM has been called in an effort to remove restrictions on the transfer of promoter shares the aim is to repeal a clause in the company's articles of association which gives them the right of first refusal over the acquisition of each other's shares the move will allow either side to sell or transfer shares to a third entity without giving each other notice RBI will present its fourth bi-monthly monetary policy tomorrow. The central bank is expected to keep repo rate unchanged, keeping implications of the Omicron variant in view and may hike reverse repo rate, the rate at which the RBI borrows from banks. The reverse repo has come into focus as the RBI has indicated that it will start normalizing liquidity in December even while retaining an accommodative stance. This is seen by some as pointer to a reverse repo rate hike from the present level of 3.35%. Even as Prime Minister Narendra Modi inaugurated a fertilizer plant in Gorakhpur today, the central government is planning a massive fund infusion for two new fertilizer factories. Business Today TV has learned that the center is planning an 8425 crore rupee viability gap funding scheme to boost domestic manufacturing and reducing the import of urea, DAP and ammonia. Let's bring Chetan Bhutani on for more details on this. So Chetan take us through what's being planned. You will have to reduce India's import bill Uh, the government of india is planning a 8425 crore viability gap funding scheme for import substitution of fertilizers that is on the cards currently uh, my sources are telling me that the government's draft national uh, national hydrogen mission has proposed uh, to cover two green urea plants of about 1.3 million metric ton per annum capacity for fertilizer production from green hydrogen remember green hydrogen is hydrogen produced from renewable energy sources in fact in the initial stages the government will uh, support the cost difference between Uh, the domestically made green hydrogen uh, based fertilizers and benchmark price of imported fertilizers through the viability gap funding in fact in 2019 you remember in india imported about 10 uh, million metric tons of urea 5 million metric tons of uh, dap and 3 uh, million metric tons of ammonia worth about 6 billion dollars so definitely to cut down on the import bills for fertilizer sector uh, india is planning such a scheme in the coming times it could be a game changer for the fertilizer sector All right, big uh, changes coming in there in that sector. Chetan, thanks so much for bringing us that story. It was a termination call from hell for hundreds of employees. The CEO of a US-based mortgage company, Better.com, fired more than 900 employees over a brutal Zoom call. Why does this interest us? The CEO is of Indian origin. 
it's been a really, really challenging decision to make. I've, this is the second time in my career I'm doing this and I do not, do not want to do this. The last time I did it, I cried. Um, this time I hope to be stronger, but we are laying off about 15% of the company. The webinar lasted just three minutes, but by the end of those 180 seconds, 900 persons had lost their jobs. Employees of home loan provider Better.com across the US and India had been fired by the company's CEO Vishal Garg. His argument? The fired employees were so lazy that they effectively stole customers from the company. The terminations, which amount to 15% of the company's workforce, comes just ahead of the Christmas holidays, usually a time of good cheer in the US. If you're on this call, you are part of the unlucky group being laid off. Your employment here is terminated effective immediately. Interestingly, Vishal Garg is a controversial figure, having been involved in altercations with his ex-partner, who he threatened he would staple against a wall and burn alive. He had been accused by his partner of manipulating financial documents and creating multiple shell companies. This comes at a time when Indians across the world have been basking in the glow of Parag Agarwal being appointed the CEO of Twitter, of the fact that Indians are ruling tech boardrooms worldwide. Thank you for each and every one of your individual contributions to better. People online have been sharing this video on social media platforms, with many slamming the founder CEO of Better.com for his actions. Interestingly, the SoftBank-backed mortgage lender announced in May it was going public and last week received $750 million in cash as part of the deal. The company is now valued at $7.7 billion, making it ironic that the cash-rich company had to fire so many of its employees. Bureau Report, Business Today Television. Let's also go across to brand expert Harish Bijur now joining us uh, to discuss uh, some of the implications, the uh, fallout of this uh, massive firing. Harish, thanks so much for being with us. On one hand, you have the Indian community high on the successes of the likes of Parag Agarwal. On the other hand, you have this CEO from hell. How does this affect the image of the Indian global CEO? Okay, I think what has happened is a very, very sad thing to have happened, you know, uh, and I think uh, it had uh, lacked sensitivity because, you know, if 15% of the organization is being sacked and 900 of them on a Zoom call, that's as insensitive as it comes. But it has made news. Uh, the point I'd like to make is that if we tend to own a person of Indian origin to be a CEO who's a success out there in the United States of America, the latest example was the Twitter CEO. Uh, I think we should own even, uh, you, you know, negatives. So I think it's sad. Uh, but at the end of the day, I don't think, uh, you, you know, a CEO has a nationality. Uh, to an extent, it's business. And most of the time, it's business as usual. Harish, what are the lessons in this for Indian startups who face uncertainty and ups and downs in business? Well, uh, uncertainty is the cornerstone on which every business is built. In fact, uh, Indians have gone through the dot-com bust many times around, twice thus far. Uh, so I do believe one needs to be prepared. When you work within a startup culture, uh, there is joy at times and there is sorrow at times. Uh, but the sad far part of it is that 9.9 .9 times of it out of 10, it is sorrow. So I do believe if does, one does work in environments such as this, one needs to be prepared. Working within new organizations is always a gamble. And I do believe when the gamble pays off, nobody complains. But when it doesn't, everybody is crying. Absolutely. Harish, thanks so much for joining us and taking us through your perspective on uh, one of the big headlines in the business world this evening. Yet another SUV in the market with Volkswagen launching the all-new Tiguan.
The SUV, powered by a 2-litre petrol engine with a power output of 190 HP, has been priced at 32 lakh rupees. It will be available next month. Interestingly, there are not too many cars or SUVs in this range, with most available options either much cheaper or more expensive. The only other vehicle that Tiguan is in direct competition with is the Citroën Aircross C5. However, there is a small overlap with the Hyundai Tucson and the MG Gloucester as well. Listen in to the brand director at Volkswagen, Ashish Gupta, some of the key features of the new Tiguan. The Tiguan is a true Volkswagen in every manner. With an enviable performance and progressive design, the Tiguan makes an all-round impression. It is versatile and hosts a range of driver assist and infotainment systems on board, making this SUVW capable of handling every motoring situation with aplomb. It gives me immense pleasure to launch the refined, updated, comfortable and connected exciting new Tiguan that is redefining what's possible. After a sharp and sudden plunge over the weekend, Bitcoin now back above $50,000. A sell-off over the weekend was the biggest since May 19. On Saturday, the crash was led by a combination of profit-taking and macroeconomic concerns. Sell-offs in many areas of the US stock market also led to the crash. Since then, Bitcoin has firmly risen in line with equity markets. As per analysts, the market sentiment is back as Omicron's effect looks milder than was earlier thought to be. Former RBI Governor Raghuram Rajan discusses the biggest challenges for the Indian economy and farm laws in an exclusive conversation with Rajdeep Sardesai. Listen in. Is your sense that the worst is over? That, that perhaps uh, we will see a steady economic recovery even allowing for these variants, assuming that they are not as deadly as the previous ones? I think given that assumption, we are on the way out that, that uh, you know, we are learning to live with the, with, with the virus uh, and we are learning how to manage our economies in this process. And of course, the amount of uh, pent up demand is going to take us still uh, a little further. Now, of course, uh, there's the other disease which we are facing, which is the excess, uh, which results in inflation. Uh, you can see higher transportation costs are now showing their way into pr higher prices. You can see labor very tight in many industrial countries showing up in higher wages, higher inflation. And of course, inflation doesn't stay restricted to one part of the world. It spreads more widely. So the, the problem we are, we are seeing now is, uh, is perhaps excess demand relative to supply, which is resulting high, in higher inflation. Number of emerging markets, central banks have already started tightening. And so uh, what that does is constrain the amount of, uh, of space down the line. If you were Reserve Bank of India governor still, you'd be conscious of inflation. I would as, certainly. I, I, as your major challenge at the moment. I, I, so I, I think you, it's always tempered with what the growth situation is, right? Uh, you have to think about whether there's enough supply capacity in the economy so that you can survive this level of demand without inflation going through the roof. Uh, I think in India we are seeing a rebounding economy. Uh, the question that, uh, that the Reserve Bank will uh, have to address, of course, is, is this rebound so strong that is, it's exceeding our supply uh, capacity? The fact that inflation is still quite strong suggests that that question is not an irrelevant question. Uh, let's look at the Indian economy for a moment because uh, there's a general belief, at least India's economy managers say, we've come out of the pandemic or hopefully the tail end of the pandemic a little stronger than other countries. Last quarter, uh, a growth rate 8.4, before that 20%, suggesting they say a V-shaped re recovery. Do you see it as a V-shape or do you see it as you earlier told me, uh, India versus Bharat conflict, two countries in a way, one struggling to come out of the pandemic, the other moving ahead and seizing opportunity. Well, both can be true at the aggregate level. The, now, V-shaped is not anything to crow about. <laughs> Create a bad enough downturn and the recovery will always be V-shaped. Uh, I think what is important is have we sort of come out of uh, the, the earlier malaise and are we going to reach back to our trend level of, of growth? Now, to some extent, we are back to where we were in 2019. 
A number of countries are there, so it's, we're not the only country that's back. But we also were a reasonably fast-growing country, 5%, 6% was what we were growing. Now, we haven't done that over the last two years. So effectively, we, we've just made up the, the ground that we lost in going down, but we haven't made up the ground we lost because we were already growing at a fast pace. Sure. And that growth has to be made up still. And that will still take some time to make. So before we start growing, we have to say, look, are we at a reasonable play, uh, place to grow further? And, and I think we are. We are. But we have to do a lot of things to try and get the growth that India truly deserves. Mm -hmm. Where we should be growing is 8 9%, right? Uh, that's what's necessary to create the jobs for all the young people coming out. You know, we had this population dividend. That population dividend becomes a dividend only if those young people can get jobs. So the question we should be asking ourselves is, how do we multiply the number of jobs? And is it only through you know, some kind of focus on manufacturing? Or can we emphasize the areas of the economy which have always done well for us, services? Mm -hmm. you know, we've got a fantastic uh, IT sector, which is benefiting from the global uh, boom. Today, it's very, very hard uh, to find people in the IT sector because uh, you know, uh, that's where employment is. You talked about two Indias. India is the IT sector. Sure. Bharat is in the villages. Bharat is in traditional manufacturing, where you know we still are not investing too much because demand is still still low. What we need to do is pump up India, but also find ways to support Bharat in a much more effective way. Do you believe that the farm reforms were actually uh, a step in the right direction, and should and the government should have stuck to its guns? No, I, I, look, I think there are elements in those farm laws which I think many people would agree to. Uh, the point is the package as a whole had some problems. The, the greater problem is that different states, different regions in India require different parts of the package. And there's a lot of uh, you know, differentiation uh, across the regions. Uh, some regions, for example, don't have strong agricultural markets. Uh, others have well-functioning agricultural markets. So you, the one-size-fits-all doesn't really apply. And part of the uh, sort of reason for pushback is the attempt to put a one-size-fits-all framework on India. We, we need to have a frame, framework which is much more sensitive to the different demands of different regions. Now, that said, mm -hmm. I think we do recognize, and it, I think farmers also recognize, that you can't continue producing rice and wheat in such quantities, especially rice in some of the most water-starved areas of the country. So we need to have a more sensible policy which shifts production to some other crops which are more needed. Uh, but right now, you know, farmers are doing what is most remunerative and what is most supported. So we have to find ways to shift this. But this has to be done in a sensitive way, in a way that assures them that the incomes will not disappear overnight. I think what the center's job is, is to give an overlying framework within which there can be a lot of decentralization. Uh, it's not the center's role to micromanage what happens everywhere and to say this will be uh, uh, the laws. The Reserve Bank of India governor, one of your successors, uh, has come up and said very clearly that he is, he seems very, very skeptical about cryptocurrency and worried about cryptocurrency. What's your sense? Well, I, I think uh, the technologies behind cryptocurrency are certainly very interesting and will over time uh, sort of uh, be more widely used. For example, blockchain, uh, decentralized ledgers, which are uh, really what blockchains are. Um, and, um, you know, some of this, uh, this new fintech um, trying to sort of gather information together uh, could solve some of the problems that we're talking about. So MSMEs, for example. What is the true value of cryptocurrency other than making payments? Right now, it's very hard to see that. Even for payments, it is relatively, uh, you know, there are many other 
compa competing ways to make payments. In India, you can make payments through UPI. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to see a huge magnitude of value associated with more than a few cryptocurrencies. I have no doubt a few of them, Ether, uh, et cetera, might survive. But there are 6,000 cryptocurrencies. Will all of them survive? Probably not. And this is where the regulator gets worried. Uh, supposing I say this is fine to, to invest in, and 98% of these go bust, <laughs> then I'm sort of, as a regulator, uh, I've just uh, put my chapa on them, and uh, people have lost money. So, uh, you know, you're damned if you regulate and say they're okay. But if you don't regulate them, it becomes a wild west, right? People raising money from the public without any questions being asked, without any sense that this is a reasonable scheme and unreasonable scheme. So in a sense, you're caught between a rock and a hard place as a regulator. If you regulate it, people run to invest more, and that's a problem. If you don't regulate it, it becomes the wild west, and uh, people invest in it and say, you should have been regulating when they lose money. That's where we leave it on the show today. Thanks so much for watching.